Bonjour, konnichiwa, strasdwitsche, hello. Hello to our participants and welcome from around the world. Today, we will have a, a interesting webinar with participants also from Japan. So let me say something for them. Minasama, gamen shita no chikyuugi o klikku suru to nihongo o sentaku dekite tsuyaku o kiku koto ga dekimasu. First, let's deal with some technical details. We have translation into English, Japanese, and Russian. You can choose your language by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. One of the panelists will speak Japanese, so please click on English now if you don't understand Japanese. The chat icon is for remarks and information. The bios of the panelists will be available there too. For questions, please use the Q&A icon. Some of them will be answered by our staff or viewers, and a few will be dealt with by the panelists during our Q&A session. My name is Chantal Shetla Gomagata. I'm the coordinator for Universal Peace Federation in Europe, and it's a pleasure to greet you here. In this session six of our August International Leadership Conference, four experts will examine from different viewpoints some resources for peace on the Korean Peninsula by looking at the Korean people's common history and culture. We will be hearing from uh, Professor Thomas Huang. He is still on a conference now, so he'll be coming a little later and he will speak on the common history and culture. And then Professor Yoshizumi Asai from Japan, he will explain about the Chuche ideology. Then Dr. Alan Lefkowitz from Israel, he will speak on the political and economic challenges for unification. Then Dr. Thomas Silover, he lives in the Republic of Korea. He will speak on the spiritual values rooted in a society of interdependence and mutual prosperity. Why is UPF organizing numerous discussions worldwide on peace on the Korean Peninsula? UPF founders were both born in what is today North Korea, and they fled the North during the Korean War. They experienced the tragedy of division due to opposing ideologies. Most countries affected by such division were able to reunite thanks to a common language or culture or even history. Why is it taking so long for the Korean Peninsula to be reunited? What are the elements needed for the two sister nations to find a common ground for a win-win situation? and a new paradigm. Without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. It's Professor Yoshisumi Asai. He is a special lecturer at Doshisha University at the Faculty of Global Regional Studies. He graduated from the Faculty of Foreign Languages at Denri University, Japan, and got his PhD from Yonsei University Graduate School History Department in Korea. He's a researcher at the Institute for Peace Policies on the modern history of Korea, particularly before and after the annexation of Korea. As he will speak in Japanese, if you haven't done so before, please click on the globe now and choose your language. And uh, before he starts speaking, I would like to show a few. I was just a few days ago in an art gallery, and this art gallery is in Bern, and it's from uh, a former Swiss ambassador in North Korea based in China, who was able to collect many pictures. So if our host can put the pictures on, we'll be able to see them. So you can see this beautifully painted picture with uh, Chairman Kim Il-sung showing the future, a bright future to his son and to the people on the ship. 
And then on the next slide, you can see them as they have all the weapons needed to protect their country. And looking again into a bright future, we can see that everybody seems very happy on the picture. So it gives a lot of hope to the people of that country. Then the next picture shows the sadness. It's, it, the, the paintings are so emotional. They show the emotions of the people and it's at the burial of uh, chairman Kim Il-sung, how people really uh, were sad to lose their dear leader. And on the next picture, it's the same big painting in which we see on another side of the picture, his son, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-il, who is taking over and, and, and telling the people, don't worry, I'll be taking care of you. And the last picture of this collection that I want to show you is how great the artists are trained in making uh, beautiful nature and they are completely free to express the beauty of the North Korean nature. So let's uh, continue uh, with uh, uh, Professor Asai's speech. You have the floor. Hello, I am Asai from Japan. Um, there is not so much time, so I would like to start by sharing my PowerPoint screen with you. Is it okay? First of all, my theme was Kim Il-sung's Juche ideology and North Korea's regime. First, uh, North Korea is a country whose national system is maintained by its own communist ideology called Juche ideology. This Juche ideology emerged in the 1960s in order for North Korea to establish its own communist system in the midst of the confrontation between China and the Soviet Union, both countries which back North Korea. But this is what is believed. So then, what is Juche ideology? Uh, first of all, like existing communism, it is based on atheism, and its essence lies in humanism. The Juche ideology says that humans are social beings and human beings have two types of lives. One is the physical life and the other is socio-political life. There are three attributes to the socio-political life. Uh, which are autonomy, creativity, and consciousness. And out of these, autonomy is said to be the most important. Also, although human physical life is limited, it seems social political life can become that of eternal value by enhancing its autonomy. And it ex also explains that this can only be achieved through organizational and ideolo ideological coercion with the leader, who is Kim Il-sung. Um, we can say that uh, it is possible to say that such an idea has a structural similarity with the Christian salvation theory. The Christian salvation theory is that by believing in Jesus Christ and connecting with him, a sinner can be saved forever by becoming one with Jesus Christ. So eternal salvation cannot be realized just by the efforts of one individual. Also in the Juche ideology, as well, it is impossible for human beings to obtain eternal life by individual effort. And only by integrating with Kim Il-sung ideologically, it is possible to obtain eternal political life. Therefore, we can say that there is a structural similarity between the two by replacing Kim Il-sung, the leader of the Juche ideology with Jesus Christ. 
So then, how did Kim Il-sung create this ideology? The answer to this might be in his family background, uh, Kim Il-sung's family background and his educational environment. Kim Il-sung's father, Kim Hyung-jik, seems, he seems to have been from the peasant class, uh, but he attended Sungshin Middle School, a Christian school. Uh, and the father of his mother, Kang bang uh, was a Christian minister. Uh, especially, normally, no parent would name their beloved daughter bang -sok, which means stone tablet, but it is thought that her name, uh, they named her bang -sok, uh, which means stone tablet, a wishing for her unwavering faith in Christ. This is what is believed. So therefore, we can see that it is thought that Kim Il-sung was born and raised in a Christian family. Furthermore, as Kim Il-sung grew up, his maternal grandfather, Kang Dong-uk, had a great influence on him. He was the principal of Changdok School, and Chandog School is a five-year school established in Pyongyang uh, by Protestants from North America. And this is where Kim Il-sung studied. So from these points, it is believed that Kim Il-sung acquired a Christian background from a young age. And this is considered to be the cause of the Juche ideology. Communism denies the existence of God, and Christianity emerged uh, of it denies the existence of God in Christianity, and, and Juche ideology emerged from opposition to this. It is interesting that the Juche ideology is a kind of recreation of the communist ideology. By the way, if you look at the traditional ideologies of Korea, there is something structurally similar to the Juche ideology. For example, after the middle of the Joseon dynasty, there was a prophecy called Jongnamnok. This was the time when the dynasty was forcing a crisis due to the Bunroku Keicho War by Japan. It is called Imjin War in Korea. This Jongnamnok faith is a folk belief that after the fall of the Joseon dynasty, the true man or savior will appear from the Jong clan to build an ideal kingdom and save the people. It can be said that this ideology strongly reflects the messianic element of Christianity. And also that in the history of hardships, Human power alone is not enough to be saved. Therefore, the true man of Jonggamno can be replaced by Kim Il-sung, the leader of the Juche ideology, and we can say that there is a structural similarity between the two. Now, North Korea's regime is based on the Juche ideology. It is characterized by the fact that North Korea is a trinity of Kim Il-sung, the Korean Workers' Party, and the people. This is what is the uh, North Korean regime. The Juche ideology compares the state to the human being. So in other words, if the center of a human brain is the, uh, of a human is the brain, then the brain of North Korea is Kim Il-sung. And it is the Korean Workers Party that operates the state under his command. In other words, the Korean Workers' Party plays the role of the human central nervous system, and the people are one of the terminal cells all under its command. So the trinity of Kim Il-sung, the Korean Workers' Party, and the people requires a religious loyalty. If we look at um, this, 
Uh, to this end, the principles of the establishment of monolithic ideological system was established and they must be thoroughly implemented. When we look at these principles, we must look up to Kim Il-sung with loyalty and make his authority absolute. We must make the teachings of Kim Il-sung our creed. We must cherish the political life given to us by Kim Il-sung and repay him with loyalty. Uh, these are the principles, uh, some of the principles included. The people who are loyal to Kim Il-sung and become a trinity gain eternal political life and the nation supported by such people will not perish. This is the Juche ideology. This is what North Korea calls a social political life state. It can be said that North Korea is a religious nation. An example of North Korea's structural similarity, similarity to a Christian country is the Juche era. The Juche era is a calendar which designates 1912, the year of the birth of Kim Il-sung as the first year and this is structurally similar to the Western calendar, which designates the year, uh, the year of the birth of Jesus as the first year. And finally, the question is how the regime based on the Juche ideology is, min is maintained. This is largely due to the education of the people. Around 1988, when the socialist countries of Eastern Europe began to collapse, North Korea's kindergarten was based on a system in which children lived in the kindergarten uh, during the week. So for six days, during the whole week, uh, they would live in the kindergarten and only on Sundays they would go back to their parents. This was the system that the kindergarten had. And at this kindergarten, they teach that Kim Il-sung is a great father who gave his people a political life. So the children of those days are now around 40 years old, and they are the ones supporting North Korea today. So, it is no exaggeration to say that the North Korean regime is not maintained through force, but through education. Uh, this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation. A really amazing uh, understanding of what our childhood's teaching can have, what impact it can have on our lives, right? And uh, I guess uh, we can understand a little bit more uh, about North Korean people's faith in their great leader. So you spoke deeply about Chairman Kim Il-sung's origin. Well, this is a question to you. In a Christian environment and the Chuche ideology he came up with for his country. So what aspects of the original ideology have evolved and what are those still in force under Chairman Kim Jong-un's regime? Is it still the same or has it changed? Uh, first of all, regarding the question about the ideological difference and continuity between the Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il eras. Um, in, I think that uh, between those two, rather than saying there is a difference, uh, it can be said that Kim Il-sung was the founder of the ideology and his son, Kim Jong-il, Systema systematized and established the national system. This is what I think. Uh, it, in more detail, Kim Il-sung started 
uh, the mentioning the Juche ideology around 1966. And around this time, uh, the conflict between China and the Soviet Union backed, uh, both uh, China and Soviet Union were backing North Korea. It was in 1973 that the Juche ideology was systematized. And this comes just after China was reconciled with the United States and isolation of North Korea furthered. And at the same time, it was when Kim Jong-il was nominated as the successor as well. So Kim Jong-il, it was Kim Jong-il that systemized the Juche ideology and established uh, this uh, Kim Jong-il regime. So therefore, I think rather than uh, whether there is a difference or there was a change, I would say that <clears throat> uh, Kim Il-sung was the creator, he established it, and Kim Jong-il uh, systematized it, and it is continuous. This is what is important. So they, had, they both had different roles. This is what I believe. Our next speaker comes from Israel. It's Dr. Alon Lefkowitz. He, from the Department of Asian Studies, Korean Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's also the head of the Department of Social Sciences and Citizenship at Beit Berl College. He published articles on arms control in Asia, Korea, Middle East relations, United States forces in Asia, and many others. Dr. Lefkowitz teaches courses on the foreign and security policies of Asian nation, international organizations in Asia, and the Korean politics and history. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> It sounds better if you mute yourself, yeah. <laughs> they translate my jokes, oh my God. Okay. Um, so let's start on, uh, on, the, on the political and economic uh, uh, challenges that uh, both nations uh, face. So let's start from the, uh, from the beginning. Now, uh, the main challenge is the economic, this is a picture I took uh, during my visit in North Korea, and it presents one of the biggest challenges in uh, unifying or solving the, the, the North Korean uh, uh, economic issue. Uh, if you look at the gap, economic gap between North Korea and South Korea, it's, uh, the South Korean economy is almost, uh, is huge in comparison to, uh, to the North Korean. So, for example, ag agriculture in North Korea represent one of the, one of the difficulties that uh, uh, if one wants to solve this, uh, uh, the, the Korean issue, this is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and the, it estimated that the cost uh, of uh, unifying or solving or upgrading the, Korean, the North Korean economy is uh, it's about five to $10 trillion. It depends on the figures, it depends who make the accounting. Uh, but the main problem or the main challenge, I would say, it's not a problem, it's, it's, it's a challenge, it's the, uh, it's the process. Uh, how do you unify or how do you upgrade the North Korean economy? And I'll talk about it in a sec. Uh, the first question which will uh, influence the, the cost, uh, how, how, many, how many trillions of dollars would be, should be invested in, in upgrading the, the North Korean economy or uh, improving, not upgrading, improving the North Korean economy, is uh, the speed? Uh, do you want to make? Do you want to uh, upgrade the North Korean economy in one year, two years? Do you want to uh, look at the at the German case uh, as an example of how to uh, um, develop the North Korean economy to the level of uh, what's South Korean economy now? And uh, and the figures will differ according to the speed. Now, the South Korean, uh, if you look at Kim Dae Jung uh, and later on on Otto Wu. Uh, and even uh, the current president, Moon Jae-in, they prefer the incremental development, which means that uh, we don't want to do, we, we don't want to shake the, the North Korean regime or economy. We want to do an incremental development, which means that we want to develop North Korea uh, step by step. And one example is the Kaesong uh, uh, Industrial Complex, uh, industrial, uh, yeah, complex, which allowed to develop 
part, uh, one part of North Korea. And if it would, would, be, would have been uh, very successful, uh, then we would move to, as Nomoyon wanted to do, another complex and another complex. And by doing so, uh, you incrementally uh, develop the North Korean economy uh, uh, without spending trillions of dollars in one year and allowing to help the, uh, the North Korean uh, to benefit from this uh, development. Now, if you look at, if you go, uh, look at the North and South Korean uh, demography, uh, for example, one of the biggest challenges that uh, I would say the biggest challenge for, for South Korea nowadays is the decline in birth. If you look at the, the numbers, it's less than one. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's even less than uh, 0 0.9. Um, unification or f finding ways of cooperation between North and South uh, will have, uh, to, will, be allow, will allow uh, the, the South Korean and the North Korean to solve one of the biggest problems that South Korea faces now. It's the potential of the decline of the population in uh, South Korea. A another uh, benefit uh, that mo one would say with God divided uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula, it was divided, uh, most of the natural resources are, are in the North. If uh, unified uh, Korea, uh, will become uh, one state or uh, the cooperation between the two states uh, will improve. This, was, this will allow to use the natural resources in uh, North Korea for the benefits of both, both sides. Uh, if we look now, we see that, uh, for example, the Russians and the Chinese are trying to use these natural resources uh, uh, without giving all the benefits to the Korean people. So in the short run, if you look at from an economic point of view, in the short run, it will be very expensive. Uh, and if you look at the figures of the uh, uh, polls in South Korea, uh, when asking the South Korean, mainly the younger generation, about unification or economic cooperation with, North, with the North, when they look at the figures, they, they're not that enthusiastic about this. The, the older generation support it, but the younger generation is more skeptical. But it, so in the, in the short run, it will be very expensive for everyone. But in the long run, one would say it's a win-win situation. So the economic challenge is one thing. Another challenge is the uh, political, uh, political challenge. And when talking about uh, unification or cooperation, uh, has a huge price tag, which is a, a, a political price tag, which means that the, uh, one of the leaders, if it's Moon Jae-in or the next leader, and if it's Kim Jong-un, one would have to step down. And the problem with the uh, with politicians around the world, it's always difficult to, to, uh, to convince them to step down for the benefit of others. And this is uh, a big problem for both sides. Uh, that's why they would prefer uh, coexistence, which, which means that trying to have two states, but at the same time, trying to, uh, to improve the economic and political and cultural cooperation between the two states in order to prevent a military escalation between the two sides. Uh, it's a very optimistic view. Uh, the problem is uh, we live in a world that uh, optimists sometimes clashes with, uh, with reality. Now, if you look on the positive side of the, of the Korean people, along the years, they, fa they faced huge challenges uh, and they were able to rise again. They, uh, uh, if you look, for example, the Japanese occupation, the Korean War, the IMF crisis, and there's a long list of challenges that the, the Korean people faced, and they were able to face them and then rise again. Uh, and one, one of the important things uh, with the Korean people is the resilience of the Korean society. Whenever they face a challenge, it might be a, a short backlash, but they're able to overcome uh, uh, the challenges and, 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 uh, and the future challenges as well. So if you, you look, for example, the IMF crisis during the, the 90s, it was a huge economic crisis, but the, the, the South Korean, and I'm sure that the North Korean as well, uh, not in the case of the IMF crisis, but if you look at the South Korea, for example, the IMF crisis, despite the, uh, the high price of, uh, uh, of this crisis, they were able to overcome to develop the country and uh, to become number 12 uh, biggest economy in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for these beautiful presentations with great pictures. 
Um, a question, you know, you, you mentioned and, and we, sh we saw a few times how this pyramid is becoming like uh, smaller and smaller. And uh, it, it looks like our Western European countries, actually, if we don't have immigration, right? Yes, the same so thing. So in, in North Korea, um, actually, there's a slight increase. I checked, you know, on the, on the net. There's a slight increase in birth rates uh, since 2000. So actually, uh, the young people in, in South Korea are afraid of losing their jobs, right? We, we've heard that. But, but it seems contradictory if we think of the fact that there are not enough young people uh, to take over all the positions. So why, why don't they understand that as a win-win situation uh, in a possible reunification? That's my question. Okay, uh, it's, it's a wonderful question, but uh, politics and reality doesn't work together in most cases. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, there is an increase of unemployment in, in, uh, in South Korea, despite the fact that there is a decline in birth rate. Um, uh, but yeah, it, uh, in the long run, uh, a decline of uh, birth rate uh, will influence uh, uh, the industry, will influence, for example, if you, if you look at the universities, the number of students that will enter the universities will decline in, in the long run. If you, if you look at, at the figures, every uh, oh, almost every month, more people die in South Korea than the number of people that uh, uh, are born. And uh, this will not just influence the, uh, the education, it will influence the army, it will influence the, the industry, it will influence the pension as well. Uh, but what, what, what you're talking about is uh, the future. Uh, if, you, if, you talk to, uh, uh, if you talk to people and tell them that in 10 years, in 20 years, if you don't do anything now, uh, we will have a crisis. And people will say, who cares about uh, 20 years? What we care is about is about now. And if you look, for example, we care about passing the uh, university exam and entering the university. What will happen in, in decade, two decades? It's, it's not my problem. And, after and, me, the flood, right? Yeah, yeah. After <laughs> me, the flood. Plus, it, what, what you expect is a politician to look uh, beyond his term. Mm. And this is, I would say, this would say one of the biggest problems that uh, politicians all around the world, what they think about is what their short-term legacy. You, you expect people to say, hey, let me, uh, uh, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, in, in China. This is uh, an initiative for, for decades, if it's positive or negative. But here is a project that looks at, at, at the long run. Mm -hmm. And politician, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, mo uh, many politicians don't, uh, share your view that we have to think what 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 might happen in, in a decade or two, and they would not pursue a policy that uh, will uh, will influence the future. Thank you very much, and uh, <laughs> we will continue with our next speaker. It is Dr. Thomas Sellover. He's president of uh, Sonat UP Graduate University outside of Seoul, Korea, and also serves an, as international coordinator for IAAP. It's the International Association of Academicians for Peace. He has his doctorate from Harvard University and comparative religion and East Asian philosophy. Dr. Selover has taught for over 25 years at universities and colleges in Canada, in the US, as well as in China and Korea. Dr. Selover, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mrs. Komogata. It is indeed a happy occasion for me to be able to join this webinar, and I've learned a lot already. So let me see if I can uh, smoothly share my screen with you. Oh, this one is, yes, good. Okay, so my, my, my particular topic is headwing thought, interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values in relation to Korean culture and uh, uh, on the Korean peninsula. So, and, and peace indeed. Okay. I chose the wrong link. That is a best mistake. Let me do this again. Please let me share again. And I will fix that. 
Okay, there we go. Uh, yes. Okay. And we did this, believe it or not, of course, we, it was very smooth when we just we did, did it this. a few minutes ago. It worked. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, my goodness, <laughs> how did that happen? I um, We may have to do without it, but I'm hoping that we won't. We may ask uh, the host to do it for us. Let me try one more time and then mm -hmm. otherwise, yes. Okay, this should be this one. Okay. And then, yes. Um, that is not doing what I want. So perhaps we have to ask the host yes. if the host can share it. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, host is all prepared. So very good. Oh, quick. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, I don't know if I can click, if I can. No. Pro no, I can't. Probably. He can give you the right to click, actually. It's possible. Otherwise, just say next. Okay, next slide, please. So um, here we have the typical map of the Korean Peninsula today, sharply divided between two regimes that are fundamentally antagonistic toward one another. Um, I need to be, next click, please. There we go. Okay, this map then represents the hopeful, peaceful map of a unified Korea which is also representing the unified tradition of Korea before this political division. So the question is, and I needed one more click, um, actually two, how do we get from one to the other? And it's in that light that I want to present something about headwing thought as a, as a way to move from one to the other. Next slide, please. So in terms of the genesis of headwing thought, we can find it here. This is a quotation from Dr. Hak Chahan Moon, referring also to her husband, Dr. Samya Moon. My husband and I, having directly experienced the destructive nature of militant communism, were committed to preventing the spread of such a system in other parts of the world. At the same time, we recognized that the so-called free world was in a state of moral and spiritual decline. The foundations of faith, family, and freedom in liberal democratic societies were not healthy. My husband tried to bridge the division between liberals and conservatives so that together we could build a good society and nation. He coined the term headwing to balance left and right ideologies. Through headwing thought, we have been working to create a world based on the values of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universally shared values. Next, please. So, they have picked up and promoted these three, interdependence, mutual prosperity, universal values. In Korean, gong seng, gong yong, gong wi, all connected by the concept gong, which means something like mutuality or shared resources. Next, please. <clears throat> so the first of these is the concept of interdependence, gong seng, based, we can say, on the nature of existence itself as we find it. The more we investigate, the more we discover the delicate balance of interdependence through the field of ecology at all levels, from, from microorganisms up to macro systems. Next, please. Here, I would just point out the environmental ecology of Korea is very much influenced by surrounding nations. And particularly, we're aware of westerly winds coming from the Gobi Desert, which uh, strongly affect the environment in both uh, north and south of the peninsula. So uh, we are in an interdependent situation uh, naturally and necessarily. Next, please. Also, uh, among human beings, our primary relationships are also interdependent. Parents and children, husbands and wives, students and teachers, friendship, citizen, and so on. All of these are reciprocal interdependent relationships. So too in economic relations, exchange values are based on the interdependence of buyers and sellers, wholesale and retail, and therefore all ownership is in the context of interdependence. Next, please. So we can put it diagrammatically in this way, centered on an original design or purpose, 
humans and the natural world are in an interdependent synergy with one another, a dialogical process of give and take mutuality leading to prosperity for all. Next, please. The second is mutual prosperity, whether thought of in economic or in political terms, it means fundamentally that the think seeking the benefit not only of me and you, so-called win-win, but actually focused on the whole purpose, so that it is also a benefit to others. We can call this win-win-win solutions. Next, please. We can diagram mutual prosperity in this way, based on parental type of love and purpose, centered relationships as a kind of extension of the family model, family, society, nation, and world, leading to mutual respect, good governance, harmony among stakeholders, and peaceful prosperity. Next, please. The third is universal values or common cause, or we can even translate it literally as co-righteousness. Recognizing that each person has his and her conscience or original mind, which is the basis of human righteousness and human rights. Therefore, there's also a basis for mutual respect. It's the religious traditions generally that have been primary carriers of universal values. Next, please. We can diagram it in this way. On the individual level, each of us as a unity of heart, mind, and action is developing our personal character. On the level of society, we and you and all of us together realize values that are in some ways intrinsic, the desire to seek value and the desire to personally realize value. Next, please. So um, I want to mention about universal values now and again on, with respect to the Korean Peninsula. So this political map, next, please. And our uh, unified map. And the point here is that there's a common religious and cultural heritage and it includes the various elements. Next. Uh, one is the shamanistic tradition, which goes all the way back to the, the origins of Korean society, uh, according to the legends about 5,000 years ago in the Dangun tradition. This sense of a harmony between uh, nature and the human community. Next. Secondly, the Confucian tradition has made a deep impact on the whole of the Korean peninsula. This basic way of thinking that connects the family to the wider social relationships. Third, next. Then the Buddhist tradition also has made a home on the Korean peninsula as a, 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 a teaching that tries to overcome self-centered uh, actions and motivations, self-centered desire. Next. And Christianity, although a latecomer to the Korean peninsula, is also strong in Korea. Next, please. So these three core principles of headwing thought, interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values, all center on this concept of mutuality, which I've got in the Chinese character up in the corner. The value of mutuality has been carried, as I said, by the religious traditions of Korea. Next. Interdependence, with the natural world is deeply connected to the earliest religious tradition of the Korean people and their legendary founder, Dan Gun, who is also celebrated in the North. Next, mutual prosperity modeled on the family is deeply connected with and carried by the Confucian tradition. Universal values have been sought, discovered and realized, next, through both the Buddhist and the Christian traditions both on the level of the individual and on the level of the whole society. Next, please. These core religious and cultural traditions of Korea also have resonance with the surrounding nations, which are key to the peace on the Korean peninsula. So just a couple of clicks, we'll populate these traditions once again. The shamanistic tradition, next, the Confucian tradition, the Buddhist tradition and the Christian tradition, which I include the USA in here. So all, this common cultural background provides deep roots that can spring up through um, 
the impediments caused by the political division. That's, that's my, the argument here. Next, please. As one specific example of headwing insights in relationship to peace building on the Korean Peninsula, I would mention the personal summit of the founders of UPF, Dr. Samyung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, held with Chairman Kim Il-sung of North Korea in 1991, 30 years ago this year. In order for that major event to, to happen, these were some of the essential conditions. It was essential <clears throat> that the UPF founders came to the summit meeting on the foundation of tremendous work in civil society, building linkages of interdependence, not only in Korea, but also throughout the world. And that was a key to making this event possible. Secondly, mutual prosperity is represented by the, the brotherly attitudes, the family attitudes that were part of the rhetoric and the ritual of that personal summit meeting. And it turns out, and this is connected to the longer and deeper Confucian tradition, that political relations are expressed in terms of familial relations. And it's one kind of ritual element that can help uh, break through political impasses. And then third, on the question of universal values, the cooperative devotion of many conscientious people and organizations was needed at that time, and it is needed also today for the ongoing peace and reconciliation process. Next, please. And last, therefore, I suggest that heavenly unified Korea can be realized through the headwing insights, insights of prosperity, of interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. Thank you. As manifested very much. in the shared resources of Korean culture. That's the content I have to share with you today. I look forward to our discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank carefully. you very much. I uh, I will not ask you a question now. There will be many questions in our QA session. Sure. I'll directly go to our final speaker. And uh, he was busy with another webinar and he just came in and it's Professor Thomas Huang. He is the international chairman of the Chinese People's Federation for World Peace. Since 2017, he has directed the inauguration of this organization in 10 cities around the world. Amazing. And he also serves as sub-regional president of UPF, responsible for the greater China area. From 1985 to 1998, he and his wife taught English at three universities in China. And at the People's University in Beijing, he became a visiting scholar and set up a Korean Studies Institute. There would be many more things to say. You'll see them appear in the chat. So, Professor Huang, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent scholars real experts on Korean issue, something on economy, should, which I have no much understanding about economy. Well, Dr. Asai and Dr. Levkowitz, you are, have a, such a detailed and a fundamental understanding and a inspirational uh, explanation so clear and so real. And then the, when I heard, when I were invited, uh, invited for these uh, meetings, I, I talked with my dear friend, you know, the real Korean expert, his name is Michael Green. You may know Michael Green, he's the outstanding and uh, as a prominent uh, journalist living in Korea from England. And then he wrote several books about uh, Kim, Kim Jong-il, North Korea's dear leader. And the, the new and the book, another one is the book, Koreans, the new Koreans, the story of a nation. And uh, the, the first one actually is the Koreans, who they are, what they want to do, Anyway, he has many books. I talked with him for, for an hour. And then we are, we agreed on something and we disagreed and we argued. And then I, 
And then I have some, say, I myself want to say my own things. That is the, the title I made like this. The unification of Korea with Chinese support. Without Chinese support, unification will never happen. That is my conclusion. Well, let me say something uh, before the made, made the conclusion. As you know, the Korean people were united as one people, united with one language, one culture, and shared values for thousands, thousands of years. It was our people's great misfortune that after World War II, because of the rivalry between world powers, our country was suddenly and unexpectedly divided the two. The Korean people had virtually no say about this. Then in a decade that followed, the Cold War rivalry between the democratic world countries and the communist countries play out our peninsula and widen the divide between us. Now, more. Uh, More over oh, 70 years, yes. Two generations of young people had been born in this unfortunate situation. They have been raised under different system and part by different values. Even now, unification of our country is a national priority for both South and North Korea. However, our two governments have very different vision for the future of our, of our nation. The situation in Korea is in fact a microcosm of the dilemma facing the world. The conflict between North and South, rich and poor, and the conflict between East and West, right and left, are both in Korea. There's also a spiritual confusion, a conflict between spiritualism and secularism is a, the microcosm of the problems. And uh, plus, National interest of the six countries all collides in Korea, as you, you all know. The United States and Japan, Russia, China, the less of those of North and South Korea. For a while, the six-party talk seemed like a way to address all its interests, but no agreement could be found. And after six years of negotiation, they evaporated into thin air as if nothing has happened. There is saying in Chinese and Korean, one who tied a knot had to untie it. This means the nation that divide our country had to be involved in uniting it. It is not something that Korea can do on its own. As you know, North Korea attempted reunification just two years after the division by invading the South, 1950, during the Korean War. Or ended in draw between the UN forces and the Chinese who backed North Korea. Realistically, as Chinese power and influence have grown into the world, we need to focus on relations between China and Korea. The United States is far away, <laughs> but China is very near our neighbor. As always, our relationship dates back thousands of years. For centuries, Koreans respect China as a big brother nation because of its culture as well as its size and power. That's real. Now, although the world has changed in many ways, the reality is that the neighbors have to live together in peace. As I see it, the best way to advance the situation is for South Korea to in initiate diplomatic talk with China. South Korean leaders and diplomats need great wisdom to handle this situation. But I believe there is a way to gain China's cooperation in Korean unification. First of all, China's main concern is South Korea's military alliance with the United States, especially the presence of US forces in our territory. 
frankly, if China and South Korea can come to a mutual security agreement, there will be no need for US troops to remain in Korea. This is an issue that has been controversial in the country for a long time. Many South Korean already support the withdrawal of US forces. Some will oppose it here. Well, many people, many Korean people fear the reliance on China, that's, that's true too. Therefore, the solution is for Korea to declare itself a neutral nation like Switzerland. This is actually, this is my conclusion. If South Korea can convince China that it is the, it, Korea's ultimate goal, there's no reason for China to resist Korean, Korean unification. It is in China's, China's interest to have a peaceful United Korea as its neighbor. Why not? Of course, China will have to negotiate with North Korea concerning its nuclear weapons, but I believe this is something that can be worked out as well. If China backed unif reunification, no, no, no problem actually. In short, great wisdom and diplomatic skills are essential to bring about Korea reunification. But it should not be seen as impossible. It is possible it should be done. No Korean really want to have foreign forces in our country. Becoming a permanent and neutral nation like Switzerland is our best option. Everyone and Mrs. Moon have proposed that a peace park could be built in the DMZ, currently divided North and South Korea. They have also suggested that it would be the perfect location for an Asian headquarters for the United Nations. This would help protect the international status of Korea as a neutral nation. Well, some of my friends and experts have argued that this region of the United Neutral Korea is a fantasy. But my view is that all good outcome begins as ideals. We need to envision a positive outcome and then promote it consistently and persuasively. If we can communicate our dreams to the Chinese leadership, owning their trust and support, strongly believe there is a way forward. The Chinese people have been known for thousands of years for their practicality and wisdom. I believe they can come to see that this plan will serve their interest to advance world peace. Therefore, I would recommend to both South and North Korea and China leaders and diplomats that they elevated their perspective and find a way to work together to solve the very complicated problem of Korea unification. The Korean people cannot abandon our dream of a peaceful United Nation. It's, it's a must. It's up to us, up to us to work with our neighbors, make it a reality. I think this is really this is the only way we have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. A visionary uh, speech and uh, uh, new, new things that you mentioned that maybe some of our viewers and uh, panelists are surprised about. And every vision at the beginning seems fantastic or, or impossible. Let's see what it needs, what is required to make it true. Thank you very much. So now, uh, we will go to the questions from the viewers, and I will give the, the word to Melanie Kumagata. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of Geneva in Switzerland, the neutral country you were speaking about. And she's currently doing her master's degree on East Asian studies and doing her internship with UPF. 
So Melanie, you have the word and let's have all the panelists appear so we can really have a discussion together. Thank you very much, first of all, for giving me the chance to ask a few questions from the audience. And also thank you so much to all the panelists for your very insightful presentations. I learned a lot, <laughs> thanks to all of you. So I will go on um, with the questions, first of all, to Dr. Selover, since no question was asked um, by our moderate, moderator after your presentation. The question is, um, you mentioned universal values found in common spiritual heritage. However, one of the fundamental differences between the socialist and democratic regimes is the emphasis on the one hand on state and common, common welfare, and on the other hand on personal freedom and rights. What common values could possibly reconcile two such contradic contradictory viewpoints? Well, wow, thank you very much for that question. And I think it's, it's <clears throat> very much important to see the possibility that there, first of all, that there are universal values be, um, because we're all part of the same order, the same interdependent order, I would say, and we're also all human beings. So I'm a deep believer in, in the commonality of, of humanity cross-culturally, cross-politically, and, and across historically. So I, I would say that the recognition of that that common humanity is a starting point for overcoming the, the, um, the differences in current perceptions of political arrangements. Um, that freedom and equality or freedom, I would say, and responsibility are intimately connected with one another. And so that the, the, way, the way forward in terms of universal value is not to say, well, here's the universal value, but rather to believe in the universality of value Right, And then to find the terms in which in any given interaction, we can find those values. So in other words, the common values between Koreans and Chinese indeed, but there are common values between Koreans and Americans too. So I, I, I think the picture is, that's the way to go forward. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you so much. That's very interesting to see uh, values in that way that there are common points indeed. And Perhaps there are, un there are universal values as well. So thank you very much. And also as um, Professor Huang wasn't asked any questions also after his presentation, I will ask him one. Um, so you mentioned uh, the importance of China's support uh, without which the reunification cannot occur. And also you mentioned that uh, the one who ties the knot has to untie it. So, where do you think the decisive political initiative impulse for unification should come from? Is it really only from China or should it also be from both Korea, Korea's and their allies? Um, the US, uh, should Russia also play a role? What about Japan? So do you have anything to say about that? Also considering um, the last few days events in Afghanistan with uh, America who rather lost its international authority. Oh, and this question comes from uh, Tomas Kritzkowski. Yes. Well, yeah, the Korea is uh, universally, I mean, internationally is a related. Well, we are living in a, in a global age now. So, but uh, uh, the relationship between Korea and China is uh, way more important than any other country. And it's going, it has been, it has been like this for a thousand years and it's going to be like that from now on in the long, long, long years. And then uh, we have a history of some, sometimes we have a problem, but we have a, basically we have a very peaceful, relationship in, we enjoy for a thousand years with the mutual respect. That's why, you know, Korea is Korea, has its own specialties, you know, cultural, uh, very special character and natures. Is a, we have a, a lot of influence from China, 
but we, we through through the mutual respect and understanding, we have in, we have enjoyed our neighboring uh, as a country, neighboring neighbor as a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So even in I just emphasized the China's role and responsibility for the unification of Korea. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all I just bring up the, the focus and the real things. Real. Mm -hmm. Well, very much. Oh. Yeah, I'm just emphasizing what, what is it, what's the priority of the concern? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> My concern and other people's concern, I'm just introduce the top priority. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing your viewpoint. I don't know if some other panelists, uh, perhaps Dr. Lefkowitz or Professor Asai, would you like to add something on this question or should we go on with another one? Up to you. <laughs> You can ask us. You can ask questions. We okay. Academics so, uh, always ask questions, so uh, there's there's no need. Just uh, do your job, and uh, we'll add questions if there's any. Very good. Then I will go on. Um, one question is regarding the North Korean paintings we've seen at the beginning, and uh, we saw that the great leader Kim Il Sung uh, was with his son. They were both smiling and looking at something far away. So, and with hope and, and anticipation on their faces. So what could that awaken in people's minds? It's to you, you have the, the floor. <laughs> oh, you're on. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, uh, this is how uh, pictures in North Korea, if uh, one would say North Korean propaganda or, or, or North Korean uh, way of painting uh, dictated by, by the regime is you have to, uh, let's, let's compare it to, to, yes, we can. Uh, it's like giving a, a positive vision. Look, look at the future. Uh, always look at uh, at the brighter future, despite the fact that we might have economic. Uh, it's it, it, the North Korean are not are not unique for that. Uh, you can see uh, in Cuba, in other places as well, that they use art to promote values or to promote ideas that we live in uh, in uh, a wonderful place. And uh, the the future is always bright. Uh, they do it in the states. They do it in Korea. Uh, always be positive. One would say never tell the truth uh, as a politicians because uh, it might be very pessimistic. So always give them a hope in a positive way, and the North Koreans are doing it uh, in a wonderful in a wonderful way to, uh, by by doing these posters. Thank you very much. Uh, would someone else like to add something upon this question? Uh, can I can I add a, an open question? You mentioned uh, Afghanistan, uh, and the question is uh, for Professor Wang, uh, Professor, uh, other professors, and I enjoyed I enjoyed the, the webinar. Uh, interesting questions. Uh, when someone says uh, the alliance is solid, and they say it a uh, hundred times, is it an indication that it is it is solid, or should be questions and uh, uh, what uh, Professor Wang mentioned that uh, people are some some of the Koreans are calling for the withdrawal of, of the U.S. forces. Uh, the question is: Is it an indication of it's time for Korea to be an independent state, or we're not sure how solid is the alliance with the with the United States? Um, where shall we go with that? Um, of course, this is a really topical question right now. I was in a program yesterday um, in which uh, a former American congressman was speaking to a number of people in Korea as well and trying to emphasize that he, he was very critical of the decisions that led to this current situation in Afghanistan, first of all, and but also trying to reassure the Koreans that this is the, the situations are really quite different. Um, 
And I think that they are different, but at the same time, um, I think it has to, I think that there are, there are value traditions, there are bonds, just as there are bonds between individual people, there are bonds between communities um, that can help, that it's not only a political calculation on the part of the United States, but so the, the, the Christian investment in Korea, for example, which now goes both ways. I mean, there are, there are Korean Christian missionaries coming to the United States. But that's a long, that's a fairly long thing. In other words, it's not just the current the, sort of what um, geopolitical strategy, but there's other kinds of bonds between Korea and the United States that quite different than the Afghanistan situation, not to excuse what happened in Afghanistan. No, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sorry. I'm, I'm not hinting that that you should compare Afghanistan to, to Korea. Okay. These are two, two, two different question, uh, uh, sure. issues, but okay. what I'm saying is uh, the withdrawal, when, whenever Washington withdraw from Vietnam, when uh, right. uh, it raises, it right. raises right. the question. Well, I guess my response is that, that they, those words alone are not enough, very clearly. And, um, and even whether troops are stationed or not is also not enough. It, it really has to do with, are there bonds between people? Are, are there connections that go back generations? Are there are there common interests? Are there common values too? I mean, I think that's where one would have would need to look to see what's likely to happen in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, would Professor Asai like to add something upon that, or also regarding um, the question that what uh, that was asked before uh, about the. 私はあの人についてのテーマで報告しろということでしたけれども、今あの先ほどファン教授のお話に非常に関心を。So upon uh, listening to the uh, some of the uh, various topics and a lot of Q and A's that's been raised, and I'm quite intrigued about the uh, what uh, Professor Fang has talked about uh, that we cannot ignore the uh, the China and the factor into this whole unification, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, we understand that, uh, you know, this unification should not be in a closed door kind of situation that is completely communistic, as in that this is something that the China should definitely take a fullest of part of. At the same time, it is open to the rest of the world that all of us could participate, all the neighboring nations could participate. So that's what I'm thinking upon the uh, Professor Swan's idea. And of course, although there are a lot of implications as positives and negatives, but uh, at the same time, we should consider that, you know, China has... Uh, various kind of ideals that may be quite negative from the uh, the Western part of the world. And I believe that there should be a good balance between and in which uh, we're looking at the 38 parallel as the, uh, you know, having the uh, the UN, uh, the international uh, peace zone, uh, kind of the ideas in which we could all come together in that area where Korean Peninsula, where the dividing point is, to actually symbolize the unification of or the peace of so that is something that I definitely feel that intriguing and I'm understanding that that is a great idea. And uh, so I fully support that idea of, of the uh, Professor Fong. And, but just thinking in, in, in my head that, well, you know, just how we we'll be able to actually have China uh, be looping this, you know, in their initiative. The question means uh... Uh, I, I don't understand the Japanese, so... Yeah, the translation was already done simultaneously through the global... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I could but, not hear that. Yeah, but basically he uh, he acknowledged what you said and, um, yeah, the importance of China. So mm -hmm. this is basically what, what, what uh, Professor Asai said. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry, the time is already up for the Q&A, but I wonder, are we allowed to ask one more question? <laughs> Okay, one more question. One more to all of you. It's, well, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, Professor Asai, probably, I guess, you know, he can turn, he can turn it uh, with his question is that uh, China's, China centered is a, is a, is a, con his concern. <laughs> China centeredness. Hi. But uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Korea is Korea, you know. Is a uh, unification is Korea unification. Right. I just we need just help Chinese help. 
I recognize that uh, China's Chinese help is uh, the decisive. That's, that's all I want to say. Yeah. That's, uh, okay. <laughs> the big, big brother, right? <laughs> yes. So Melanie will ask one more question. And then China has been a big, good, big, big brother throughout yeah. history to us. <laughs> and I, I, I respect and I, I expect out of the best from the, all the time mm -hmm. from, from China. And yeah, you've China, lived there for a long will, time, China right? China will do the same things. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And then we'll, we'll, Korean people will remember forever. Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Professor Huan. Uh, so the last, last question, very last question is regarding um, a webinar that was held two months ago. Um, there was the head of the Swiss delegation at the DMZ and he <coughs> emphasized the importance of trust building measures uh, as a step towards peace. And do you know of any measures being undertaken between the two Koreas and can culture and history be tools for trust building, if yes, how? So to all of you, maybe we can go um, in, in the order of speech so we can have a bit of all of you speaking. So perhaps Professor Asai. Uh, to listen Hi. to the translation, Professor Huang, you, you need to- Professor, there are two things that I am thinking about. One is, click on the globe it's on the uh, bottom of your screen it's a globe if you click on there you will get the english translation yes okay yeah is, there, is everything okay uh, there are two things that i would like to propose first uh, north and south America, China, Japan, uh, <clears throat> and Russia. These four countries are uh, connected. And, I mean, these all these four countries are um, are within this uh, North and South unification. So we cannot completely ignore these four countries. So we have to make a relationship that these four countries will contribute to the unification of North and South Korea. And for that. Right now, Korea has a <clears throat> relationship with China and Russia. And if uh, North America doesn't have a relationship with America and Japan, so we have to first um, make relationships. Those two countries have to make relationships with all four countries. And uh, one more thing is we have to ev uh, we have to avoid the unification centered on China. So we have to really make uh, use of the UN. We have to make this UN uh, system. This is one thing that's important. And number two is just like I said today, uh, the ideology of North Korea. When you think of the Juche uh, ideology, I think that North Korea's system, we have to study it. And uh, here, education was very, very important. It plays a very important role. So uh, in that sense, uh, we have to really emphasize more, we have to really uh, study more this headwing ideology. So we have, even if they, even if we, they already have this ideology, we have to also make a system to educate the people. So this education system must be established. I think this is very important. We have to use uh, this education is one very important key. These are the two proposals that I would like to make. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, we will go on with Dr. Levkovitz. Hi. Um, thanks again for inviting me. Uh, <clears throat> governments have a, a political interest in a mistrust because uh, uh, no one trusts uh, the government. So, uh, there's a mistrust between governments. Politicians are wonderful, but uh, governments are some, sometimes problematic. Yeah, just kidding. Um, so in that case, in order to, to build a Confident, uh, confidence between people. In the case of North Korea, it's, it's more complicated, but in order to uh, create a CBM's confidence, confidence building measures, the one that can bypass uh, this problem is the NGOs. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, to build trust, it, 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 it's, it's very problematic, but to build trust between people is because I don't trust the government, because I don't trust the, the interest of, uh, of the politicians, 
by having, by allowing NGOs from around the world, NGOs on education, on, uh, on medical issues, on uh, other issues as well, uh, allowing them to build the bridges. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example from, from my area, the Middle East, when, where we don't trust, no one trusts anyone, but, and we have conflicts 24 seven. Uh, for example, one of the ideas was, was to talk about um, um, the Hallyu, the uh, K-pop or K-drama. And by bringing people from all from all around the Middle East, they they hate or they don't trust each other. But when you talk about the K-pop or K drama, it allows them to create a community. I would say it's like it's like a Hollywood movie that they they can share the uh, the K-pop K drama values. And by talking about this issue, never mention about religion, never talking about uh, the conflict they build bridges they build a human network and by doing by doing so they build trust and this allows them to move to the second uh, second stage which means let's talk about the other issues and i think if we can allow these ngos to build those bridges we are on the right track thank you thank you that's very interesting how another country's culture can unite other people <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you, um, Dr. Salover. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up on uh, Dr. Lefkowitz's remark that um, about the role of NGOs, because indeed the, go the governments cannot do this. It, it really depends on, on the, the foundation of civil society. And so, uh, and, and that includes worldwide. From another webinar, I've been learning about the role of European-based NGOs in North Korea, some much easier than uh, something based in the United States for pretty clear reasons. So I think this is a this is a cooperative venture. It certainly is a Korean venture, and Koreans have something to teach all of us in in working this through and and, and making it happen. Um, I think that the it, it's intriguing K-pop and also Korean dramas. One of the reasons Korean dramas are so attractive is because of the depth of human feeling that they, they tend to portray. And that human feeling is recognizable all around the globe. So I also want to feel optimistic about the possibility of culture and the NGO sector in actually building trust between the, the two uh, halves of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. The time is almost over. We need to keep going. Everybody is very busy. And uh, there would be many more discussions we could have. And you've probably heard of Think Tank 2022, right? It's with the motivation of contributing to the peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world that our co-founders launched it as a worldwide group of experts in all fields. Thus, before closing, let, uh, let me I ask one. Let me ask one sentence. Yes. About uh, 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 when I mentioned Michael Green, you know, he really surprised me that uh, all this kind of uh, talk is in the evaporated, evaporized in air. The six party talk, all the South and North talk. So he said that one reason because there is no common value. Yeah. Right. No shared value between right. South and North Korea. Yes. No shared value we have. That's the in a real that's a real issue. Mm. Actually, Michael Breen is the the to my understanding, his view so far. I talk, I talked with people. He's really hit the strike home, mm. and uh, he even he said that uh, you know the peace park in the DMZ. It's a simple fantasy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so Professor Wang, we could speak about that. Anyway, but much, I disagree with more. him. I disagree with him. <laughs> yeah. Even though okay. it, 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 even, even though simple fantasy, yep. that, that fantasy could be our dream and the dream could be realized. Exactly. So exactly. That you. was your message. So let's keep to your positive message. And Actually, I'm very grateful for all your constructive recommendations. 
um, everything that is being said here will be passed on this think tank 2022 that is actually a, 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 an instrument to contribute to this peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. And in this way, we believe that this think tank 2022 can have an, an impact on the future and will not just be everything that was said here will not just be forgotten. So I hope everybody really enjoyed the discussions. Many questions are still open and some of which uh, may be answered this afternoon because we'll have another webinar. It's the last one of uh, uh, of this series of August uh, ILC and it will be on the media at 2 p.m. So maybe you can also continue to participate. And I want to thank all of you uh, panelists for your great contribution in sharing with us your time, your PowerPoint presentations, your knowledge, your vision. And uh, also, I wholeheartedly uh, thank all the viewers from around the world for being with us, for interacting, and for your precious attention. And finally, thank you, UPF staff. Uh, who prepared and made this webinar possible. So we will end on a positive note with a six minute video of the Little Angels. It's a South Korean folk ballet who was on a tour in North Korea in 1998. You will first see the South Korean girls and then the North Korean girls and artists and sense the similarities and, and the common values in the arts. And uh, this video was taken 23 years ago. So, but we'll feel their longing to be able to dance together and sing together again. So with that video, I say to everyone, goodbye and thank you so much. <laughs> After a cute and friendly greeting, the Little Angels' songs and dances unfolded in the north, beginning with the Flower Crown Dance. The young boys and girls danced together with comical expressions. At every gesture, at every moment, the northern audience blossomed into smiles. responded with warm applause. The children were enthusiastic and concentrated totally for an excellent performance. traditional dances and songs blend together and flow on. The Korean people of the North could feel anew that all Koreans are one people with roots in a 5,000 year old culture. As the entire company excitedly performed the farm dance, the audience responded with spontaneous applause. The highlight of the Pyongyang performance was the chorus.
After singing the song, The Pioneer, as soon as the little angel sang the northern song, We are happy to meet you, our northern brethren's hearts opened wide, and performers and the audience became one. The chorus reached its peak while singing the unification song together. As they sang with tears, all the participants' hearts were longing for the day of unification. While the North and South sang with one heart, the stage and the audience became a sea of tears. The North Korean performance given in response to the Little Angels' performance was very impressive. It was an opportunity to affirm once again that although more than 50 years have passed since the division of the North and South, there are still many similar points between these people. Originality expressed by making games into dance and rhythmic movements with everyone moving as one. In response to the amazing skills which they presented in a continuous flow, the little angels cheered and gave a standing ovation. The Changgang dance and a ballad done with bells on one's wrists. And the elegant sound of the Okyogun. Although fast and strong, the gently unfolding, fully developed dance and songs of the Mansu Day Arts Troupe brought back the life and breath of the elegant Koryo time period. <laughs> 